Good evening. Not sure what that noise is, but welcome to the 2013 Missions Conference here at TBT. We start off at Life with Mission. Acts 1 8 says, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto both me, unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We're going to have a theme song for the week, and every night we're going to begin with a theme song. It's called Around the Corner and Around the World. Most of you probably never heard it before, but it's real easy. And I'm going to sing it once. If you'll stand with us, I'll sing it once, and then I want you to join in with me the, the next time around. Around the corner that you're here this evening. We're going to continue on with our, our missions conference. And uh, again, this morning we kind of just kicked it off and uh, seeing the, the motive uh, behind uh, what we should be living life with the mission, uh, and that's love. And, and this evening uh, we're excited because we're going to have a, a presentation. Uh, we're going to have a, a message and uh, just praying that God would do something in our hearts uh, just to prepare us more. Uh, just that song uh, said, to just do whatever God wants us to do, whether it's around the corner, around the world. I pray that this week that's exactly what your heart would be. God, whatever you want me to do, I just want to live life with mission. And uh, I want to do it with love in my heart as the motive. And uh, I pray that is your prayer. Um, we have a responsibility to sow the Word of God. And um, it's been given to us. It changes people's lives. And I want you to pray with me. And we're going to see a video, and uh, hopefully it'll be encouraging uh, to sow the, sow the seed in the harvest. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, God. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, not only worship, Lord, but, Lord, to be challenged by your word tonight. And as we enter into this time together, we pray that our hearts would be prepared, number one. But, God... Lord, you would do something in our hearts. God, you would stir our hearts. Lord, maybe there's someone here. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a young person. God, that you're going to grab their heart this week. Call them into the ministry. Call them the mission field. Lord, maybe you're just going to burden them, and they'll realize even as a child, as a teenager, they can be that light as well, Lord. And I pray that, again, whatever it is that you want to do, that you'll do tonight in our lives. God, above all, we want you to be honored. We want you to be glorified. Lord, again, we thank you for this time. We ask you to bless this service. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As the chill of winter gives way to a new spring, farmers already begin their preparations for a harvest. They plow fields and plant seeds because they anticipate a reward for their labor. They pursue a promise that each seed planted will yield fruit an hundredfold. As Christians, we pursue a promise. We plant and water, and we trust God to give the increase. 
Some rewards we see soon. Others will be granted when we meet Christ. But regardless of when the reward comes, the time to plant is today. One thing is sure, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. When we trust God today, we give up worrying about tomorrow. Our labor is not in vain, because we are sowing for a harvest. We, uh, each night, as I said, are going to have a special presentation uh, from one of our missionaries. And uh, this is a missionary uh, family that's been faithful and, and sowing and serving, and they're on uh, the deputation trail, and they're going to come tonight, or he's going to come tonight and uh, present where they're at and what God's been doing in their life, and uh, also have a time to field any questions that they have. So I want you guys to welcome Brother Christian Hendry. Amen. Come on down. I'm going to share with you the field of the Congo and how God's laid that upon mine and Shauna's life. And uh, before I get started, though, I do want to play a video. If we have that uh, available back there, I want to show that to you. We'll get a couple of videos back to back. Watch that. Uh, thinking back, I was mentioning it to somebody earlier today that this uh, week last year was the last week we were preparing to come back from the Congo. So some of those those thoughts, and I was looking back over my my journal notes of where we'd been doing and the things that we'd been involved in, and it just got to a point where it was just really breaking me. And it to, it's, uh, it's tough not to be back there. Uh, but I want to share with you the work. I want to share with you tonight what God has put on my heart and upon my wife, Shauna's heart as well. And before I say anything, Shauna, would you mind standing up? Because I think people just need to give you recognition for just going with this knucklehead halfway across the world to do something like that. So. 
if you don't know, me and my wife have a, a, a kind of an interesting uh, a work on this because I've heard a lot of missionary stories. I don't know if you've ever read any or followed any, but a lot of them go like this. The husband is called to go to a land, and he goes home and meets the wife and says, Wife, you're going with me to this place. And she breaks down crying in tears and said, I'll never do that. Well, it didn't work like that. Praise God. Shana actually felt the same burden upon her to go to the Congo at the same time I did. So we have something special in that. And it was just amazing that uh, she's been willing to go even with uh, going through malaria and, 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 and getting that disease while we were over there. Uh, God's doing some amazing things. And uh, we know it's a true calling because even with facing things like that, we still want to go back. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you tonight. And uh, I have nothing else to give to you right now. I have no, there's no gift bags or Starbucks cards or anything. But I can just give you my thanks. And thank you for the support that this church has given to me. And thank you, Pastor, for the support that you give me. And to everyone that sent prayers, everyone that sent cards, everyone that's taking us out to eat, everything that people have been giving, we just, we thank you for it. Uh, I, uh, I've been concerned with how to, how to share with my church family uh, what this is all about and how we got through this and how do I make you love the Congolese people the way that I do with all your heart? How, how can I make you want to help them? How can I make you know our heart for them? And well, my God gave me a helpmate in Shauna and, uh, I'd been writing some things and had, had some things set up, but I was just praying about it. And she came through earlier this afternoon. She knew I'd been, I'd been uh, asking, you know, I, just, I don't know. And she came in. She just said, remember that email you sent trying to explain to that uh, pastor so-and-so in such-and-such place that uh, you did last week or something? And she just walked out. She didn't say use this or, or you need to use this to help explain or anything, just that gentle approach. And that's exactly what I needed. So... I want you to know what my love is in and, and what my commitment is, is in. And I'm going to share it within a, a letter I just recently wrote to a pastor who was asking me questions about it. So, dear pastor, I want to take this opportunity to further explain our desire to serve in the Congo and the status of our relationship with the BBFI mission agency. During a trip to the Philippines and missions conference that I attended, my wife and I prayed that the Lord would direct us to where the gospel was needed. We thought it was in the Philippines, but after hearing the call presented by a Filipino missionary to the Congo, we both knew that the Lord had shown us where we were needed. We were led to step out in faith last June, sell our house, and through the support of our home church, secure enough funds to travel to the Congo where the Lord was leading us. And we were able to secure visas into the country through a BBFI-affiliated Congolese pastor for a maximum two-month stay. We arrived in the country on our own, and we spent two weeks with an established Baptist church in Lubumbashi. At that time, there was no Baptist missionary in the city of over 2 million people. There are some Baptist missionaries that had been established there, but they were all gone. So 2 million people, no missionaries. With Brother Elmer Dill, he was back in the States at that time, and his health was deteriorating. And Dr. Felicity Dad was back in the Philippines. So I worked with a French-speaking Congolese translator, and he preached, and, and I taught where I could, and uh, Shauna stayed right by my side, and where she could help with the ladies and the young children, she could. And after those two weeks there of just trying to figure out what on earth we are doing in a place that can't even speak English, uh, Brother Elmer Dill, who's a veteran missionary for 50 years, arrived in the country. And we met him and learned about the work that he had started there. And over the next few months, it took a while, but over the next few months, we came knit together with him. And his spirit with uh, Brother Dill, and we knew we needed to work with him and not in opposition to the work that had already begun. And it was at that point that we began pursuing a relationship with the BBFI. The requirements for career missionaries to live your life on the mission field included attending their college, BBC College. Well, I had graduated from here at Trinity Baptist Temple Institute with a BS in theology, so uh, in order for them to take us on, it was necessary to pr pursue what they call a team missionary status, total exposure associate missions work. And that means where you go aside of a veteran missionary and have an internship on the field actually working side by side with them. And this internship with Elmer Deal, in conjunction with the studies I'm doing towards a master's degree through Louisiana Baptist University, will meet all the requirements that's needed in order to continue as career, career missionaries in the Congo. It's been our committed desire to dedicate our entire life to serving a people that we already call our people in the Congo in a land that we would desire to return to. 
as Elmer Dill's time in the Congo is, is drawing to a close, we desire to see the Baptist faith in Congo reach a new generation and be carried further into the tribes in that land. And the Lord opened a door for us to serve in the Congo through the BBFI agency. And I wish to ease your heart in knowing that we are fully committed and we're persuaded to surrender our life to the Congolese for as long as God gives us life. And we feel that it was a call given to us and that we must remain faithful to it. Upon completion of our internship with Elmer Deal, we will return as BBFI career missionaries to the Congo. We believe that this is not a call given to us for a short time, but rather for a lifetime of service in Christ's love, Christian and Sean. So that's where we are. It's a little bit of info about us. Now I want to quickly give you an update of what we've been up to. Uh, we have two churches at this point outside of TBT that are supporting us and beginning to give us monthly support towards returning to the field. And several people have stepped out in faith and decided to give us monthly support as well. God has been at work in our lives, and he continues in amazing ways. One of the churches supporting us, they haven't even, we haven't even presented in their church. But they have been to the Congo, and one of the pastors has been to the Congo himself and knows of the, just as you saw in the video, their, their needs for everything you can possibly think of. It's amazing. God has just opened so many doors for us. We just went on a trip to uh, California. Don't stone me or anything for saying that here in Texas, but we did. And there's some actual Baptists out there. Praise God. Uh, I, even, I even met a pastor in L.A. in, in Venice Beach who was a Baptist preacher. He was from, uh, he had walked in, he had an OU shirt on. I was like, what is going on in the California? But uh, God has been doing like that. He'll throw people in our path that we can just get along with and and, and share our heart with and just let them know of the work that needs to be done. I'm just, I'm so thankful for it. I'm, I'm thankful for this church sending me. I'm, I'm thankful for the things we've been a part of already in the Congo. I'm thankful for the opportunity to go back and continue that work. God's ordaining our path. And it's, we've been able to now uh, partner with, uh, there's six other churches that are uh, set up on our schedule to be able to allow us to come in over the next few months uh, just from that trip to California alone. And I just want the, the kids to know that's where your money went was, uh, when we got that, uh, that love support from uh, VBS. That, that was all those dollars and pennies you pulled together. They were what helped us to be able to afford that trip to make it to California. And we got all these churches lined up there wanting to us to come in and present the work to Congo. And they can just get us back there quicker. And so I'm so thankful to this church for being a part of that. Now, just so you know, we are aiming for our full support to return back to the field by July of 2015 at latest. That's kind of my Congo or bus deadline of what I feel and what we have, me and Sean have prayed about and together with Elmer Deal, we believe that we can be able to raise that amount to continue that work. And you have to understand that the cost of living is a little bit different than here in the U.S. So just for example, like I've said to several before, the cost of a dozen eggs is about $5 and they, they import everything in. So if you want to get your hands on any kind of American good at all, it's going to cost. So uh, we're not going over there to live any kind of ex exorbitant or uh, unbelievable lifestyle, but we want to live like the Congolese, and we want to be able to work alongside of them and to be able to help them and to be able to give the, some of the money that is given to us to go there to work for them and to help them, to aid them as we can. And we were able to help some of the churches as you can see in the video, uh, one of the things we had a, a blessing to, to be a part of, and I mentioned it before, but for those who are new in church, we had a, a benefit of being there at the uh, opening of Mary Deal Memorial Elementary School, those children, and we were able to hand out supplies to those little kids. You just saw how excited they were the first day they've ever attended a school in their life. And some of them were up 14, 15 years old, and it was the first day of school they've ever had in their life. Because outside of any foreign help and foreign aid, their government doesn't supply schooling to them. So it's a different way of life. And we understand that. We know what we're getting ourselves into. Well, somewhat. I'm sure God's got more surprises for us. Just come and talk to me. I'm, I'm actually going to, um, at the end of this, if you want to stop by the table over there, I have a couple of pages of my personal journal notes of some things that happened through time. So if you I don't want to sit and bore you all night with all the events of everything that went on. Some of you have already heard some of the stories. So if you just want to stop by, I'll just give those to you, and you can see what we were doing, these crazy knuckleheads going out to the middle of Africa for seeing people get saved. And it's just amazing. I want you to know that they're still our second family. You're our family. 
And we want to give the love that's been shown to us by you to all those that have very little. And you've been given a command. And God's heart has been written in Scripture for us to follow. And he, he's made it simple. Four admissions. It's part of God's plan. So go. Just surrender your life to the mission field. Or if you can't do that, then sin. If you can't, you only have another option. And it's disobey. Because God has said, go, sin, or be disobedient. It's up to you to use to choose to surrender. We please, I beg you, let your heart be for the people of the Congo. They're not done. God is not done with them yet. And so many other areas of the foreign field that we have turned our backs on and we see on nightly news what we just don't care about. God is not done with them. And at such a time as this that he's choosing to still send out people and to send out foreign missions to a place to save. When we, when we go after raising support, it's going to be for one year. And it's going to be under the banner of team missions that I already talked about with veteran missionary Elmer Deal and Felicia Dodd Felicilda, the Filipino missionary is there as well. And then we will return and we're going to give a report on the work. And at that time, we'll present the open door for going further up and further in to the tribes and the opportunity to advance the kingdom of God for the Congo. And we just refuse in such a time as this to give any room for Satan in the uttermost parts of the earth. We're fast, we know this, we're fast approaching the end. Uh, you don't have to, I don't have to sit here and say anything more about that. You know that. And we're fast approaching that day against which Christ preached. And those uttermost parts have come to us. It fell in our laps and we have the opportunity to go and we're going to take it. We need you to help. All, all I did was just say, here I am, Lord, send me. And that's all it takes. It takes surrender to the one that can lead you every step. And we're asking you to follow us to the Congo. Come with us. If anybody wants to come, I'll get you in the country. I will find a way to get you into the Congo. That's all it takes. You can meet some of the people. You can meet a disciple of Elmer Deal. His name is Pastor McKinde. And he's leading a church of near, nearly 40 Congolese people. You could meet the, the crippled shoe cobbler, Muape who we might met each day as we traveled. He step, set up his shop right outside of the, the compound that we were staying in. And the guy's just got a heart of gold. I remember one day, when, uh, Shauna was trying to greet him in French, and she, como allez-vous? And he came up to him and said, and he just lit up like a Christmas tree because he was so excited somebody was speaking his language. It was amazing. They speak French and Swahili there. You could meet an orphan youth, we all call Junior because his name is so hard to pronounce and he's okay with it. We love him. And, and you saw him. He was the older youth in the video that had his, uh, his, his school uniform on. We were so excited. We let all of our church family know a couple of weeks back. I think it's almost been a month now that he, he passed his schooling exam and he has his, his degree for high school. And it's amazing possibilities for him. Or you can meet David Mwepu, a young youth that's on fire. And we have some pictures from from Elmer Dilley sent back of him out door to door. Well, it's not door to door. It's more like village hut meeting, but door to door preaching, door to door soul winning. Or Celestine, our fearless driver. So you remember him? Yeah. He saved our bacon so many times in narrow escapes of getting hit with oncoming traffics. Uh, unbelievable. Navigating over all that impossible terrain. Or come with us to reach out to the countless suffering. Because that is what it's about. We have our friends there to help encourage us and lift us up to keep doing this work. But it's about those people that need to get saved. That's the only reason that we're going. We have nothing else to give them at this point. We hope to be able to partner with others in the future. To be able to give them all those needs that they have. But they need to seek first the kingdom of God. And we want to be able to give that to them first. So I want to... I was thinking earlier of a way to put this for you. And for you to understand... Of what this is, what this journey is to us, and I thought of a way to think about it. We we've taken everything we have, and we've cashed it in. And we put it all down on this big roulette wheel, and in this one slot, it was marked TBT. And because we've had faith in you, that your hearts are big enough to be able to not only support all of the different programs that are going on here now and all of the different ministries that we have and all of the different mission work. But in addition to that, and in addition to your families 
and your children and all their ups and downs and your personal ups and downs and everything that you're going through, in addition to all of those things, we have faith that you have a heart big enough to help support us in that work. And you have a faith and a heart and a strength big enough to help the Congolese people. God has put it on our doorstep, and we can't turn our backs on it. The only thing that they have in Mass, they have a lot of... There's Hollywood people that are reaching out to the Congo right now because they understand. There's over 5 million people that have lost their lives in conflict in eastern Congo right now. Bill Gates, Ben Affleck, they're all involved in it, but they're not bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people, and that's what they need. The only thing that is going to raise them up from the suffering that they're experiencing right now is Jesus Christ, and they need a preacher to go and share the word with them. They have Elmer Deal, and he's 86, turned 87 years old this year. They have Pastor Feliciadot, who most of his time is a doctor full-time in the Congo, helping. They need someone to carry the gospel, is willing to go on a daily basis to them and share them Jesus Christ and ask them what it is they need and be able to help. We want you to join with us in that. We want you to celebrate and to work with us. I want you to celebrate and get excited about the time that we spent there. The, the two months we were there, there were 12 souls saved. I was able to preach in one church in Lakasi, in Lakasi, and the last day we were there on a Sunday, and one soul came to save, be saved by Christ. And it was just, we were so excited. But as I've said before, we don't know where he is today. That church after we left in Lakasi, there was no one in there. We had taken a day trip to get out there, two hours to get out there. And there's no Baptist missionary there. I'm sure, I'm sure if I check, there's probably a Mormon missionary out there. And Seventh-day Adventist out there. There's certainly Catholic out there. And I know that there's Muslim out there because the church that I stayed in was right across the street from a Muslim mosque. They need the gospel. That's what we want to be able to bring to them. So if you want to go, we'll get you there. Just love them like you would your own family. That's what we've done. Continue to love our brothers and sisters in Congo along with this. If you want, I will help you get to the Congo. And God can get us there. Now, I see these mission at will, and that's the one thing I want to leave you with. There's three levels on that, and I just keep thinking about that thing I already said before. If there's three things I could tell you about foreign missions, it's go, send, or you're going to be disobedient. Thank you so much for the love that you've given us and, the, and just the prayers. And it's a blessing to us. And we just ask that you continue to support the work to the Congo. Amen. Thank you. Dan, please stand with me. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. Well, let's pray and ask God's blessing on the offering. Father, we come before you. We thank you again for this day. I thank you for, um, Lord, just the, the work that you're doing in uh, the Hendrick family, Lord, and the work you have planned for them. And I pray that we would uh, just continue to pray for them and support them and, and love on them, God, as they are uh, traveling around gaining that financial support and prayer support. Uh, God, I pray that you would add to them what they need. And tonight, as we take up this offering, Lord, I pray that uh, above our tithes and our offering, God, we would give more, Lord, for these missionary families that are here with us. And, uh, Lord, that you would just take that and bless that and in a supernatural way for them. And, uh, Lord, we thank you again for this time, and we ask you to bless the rest of the service. In Jesus' name, amen.
that you have been blessed already, but I hope that you're not full yet because we have got a special uh, guest preacher this evening, and uh, he's been a, a friend of this church, and it's good to see his mom and dad make it out this evening, and uh, Brother Don Noble has been through a, a bunch and uh, health-wise, but we praise God that he's here, and, and uh, again, we're excited Brother Harold's here to preach, and uh, he'll uh, present what's going on with... Uh, the Noble family. Brian Noble 
Children's Foundation uh, this week, but tonight he's going to bring the Word of God, and I want you guys to make him welcome. Brother Harold, won't you come on? Thanks, Brother Christian. That just makes me want to go to Congo. Every time I see somebody slides, I have a tender heart toward missions. Amen, I really do. I do have my dad and mom here with us tonight, and I'm so glad they got to come. He's retired at 79 years old from pastoring, sat around for a few year, for a few months, and then decided he had helped start a church so at the tender age of 80. He's starting a church over just up north a little bit here. I won't tell you where it is because y'all all want to go over there and hear him preach. I don't want you to do that. I want you to stay here and hear me. And my mom, and, and I'm so thankful for them, and uh, they've been a blessing to me. I've known them all my life. Uh, <clears throat> been a, a, a real encouragement to me. Would you put, please, Hebrews eleven six up here? The Bible says in Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verse number 6, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is... And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You found that verse? Hebrews eleven six. I'm not going to preach there, but just want to bring this to our hearts and minds that what pleases God is faith. Amen. That's what pleases God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so whatever we do, whether we do it here in the States or whether we do it on a foreign mission field, whether you do it in school or at work or out wherever you are, it's got to be done by faith. By faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We've got this idea somehow or another that faith is this something vague and intangible that only theologians and doctors of the Scripture can really grasp and understand. But that's not what God meant it to be. He meant it for everyone. If you're saved here tonight, you got saved by faith. You say, I don't understand faith. Well, it's not hard. Quit thinking of it as something out there that you can't get a, get a hold of. Have you ever driven through an area of the country where someone had hit a skunk? Ew. You don't have to see the accident. You don't have to see the little swamp kitty tumbling down the road, losing guts and gallbladders along the way. Ew. He could have not knocked, slam over in the bar ditch and covered up with weeds and you don't even see him. But when you go through that area, you say to yourself or whoever's with you, whoo, right along in here is where it happened. That's faith. That's the substance of things not seen. You didn't see it happen, but it left something behind that you could actually tell right in here is where it happened. When I got saved, I got saved by faith, trusting in God who I had never seen before. And on his son, Jesus, who I never saw before. And I haven't seen him yet, but I believe by faith that he did what he did because he said it in his word. Look with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark chapter number 2. Mark chapter number 2. And as Brother Christian's already mentioned, I am thankful for my wife, Jeannie. And I'd have, would you stand please? Everybody see how pretty she is. That's right, that's right. For 38 years, I have drug her around the world. We just returned about seven or eight days ago from the Philippines, had a great trip. And I'll be showing some slides on that on Tuesday evening, I believe it is. And so I want to encourage you to be back for that. Be back every night. You're gonna, you're, there's going to be something good every night. And boy, tonight, oh, that Congo thing, that blessed my heart, preacher. God bless you. Mark chapter number 2, verse number 1, the Bible said, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that 
There was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. They come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. When he could not come nigh to them for the press, he uncovered the roof where he was. They uncovered the roof where he was. When they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said in the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Lord, help us as we look into your word that you'll let it live for us tonight. Open our eyes to see and our hearts to understand and our minds to grasp, Father, what you call the engrafted word of God. Make a little hole in our heart and plant the seed of the gospel there tonight. Lord, I pray there's somebody here lost that they get saved tonight. I pray tonight be their night. Lord, there may be someone here tonight that You've been drawing their hearts toward full-time service. I pray that sometime during this week of missions, they would say yes to you. Father, help us, and we'll love you and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If I had a title for this message, and I'm, you know me, I can't preach up here. I, I can't preach anyhow, but I sure can't preach up there. The oldest preacher I ever knew, I probably told you all this because I've told you everything was 116 years old when I met him, Dr. James Akers. Our little son, Brad, who turned 33 yesterday, was probably about four or five years old. Dr. Akers, 116, put his hand down on it, Brad's head, and rubbed his head like, you know, sometimes men do a little boy. He told my wife, said, this young man's going to do great things for God. And he's pastoring a great church down in Florida. God's really blessed him. He looked at me from, from Brad. He looked at me and looked at my wife and said, he'll die in the pulpit. So I preach down here as much as I can. Um, you know, there's, there's no reason to mess with somebody 116 years old. Faith in action. Faith in action. I guess that's what I could call this. Because now we see some things here. and I'm going to give you about 25 minutes of introduction, about five minutes of preaching. That's all I got. I want you to see the excitement that happened in verses 1 and 2. The Bible said, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to see them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Jesus was and is exciting. He's exciting to me. I love the songs that we sing because it puts excitement in our heart. I love seeing the pictures of the Congo and seeing what God is doing in, in, in their hearts over there. That excites me, amen. I remember preaching in a house. We held a revival, some revivals down in Patriot, Indiana, right on the Ohio River in southern Indiana. They didn't have a church, so they was meeting as a church in this person's house. Brother Thomas, whatever his name was, doesn't matter. You don't know him. We was meeting in this house. And, and I just, just picture your house, if you will, for just a moment. And the living room was full, and we had the sound system set up in there. We was preaching in the living room, and the kitchen was full, and the bedroom. They were sitting on the beds in the bedroom. They were sitting up the stairs, going upstairs. They had the windows open around the outside of the house, and you could see them four or five deep all around that house. And we preached the word to them. It was an exciting time. We went back for another meeting and we moved outside because that house was too small. We set up outside and across the street and just about a half a block down, they were having a, a ladies softball tournament. And we got to singing, I don't know, nothing but the blood. And they quit playing ball and started singing with us because we had a louder sound system than they did at the ball. Overpower them if you can. 
It was exciting, amen. I want to tell you something. Missions is not another week in the year. Ho-hum. Wonder what they're going to try to drag out of me. Leave your checkbook at home. That's not the way it ought to be. It's exciting because God is wanting to do something in our hearts and lives for the benefit of somebody else. We've got the Lord. We've got Walmart. Preacher and his dear wife and family took us out to eat today. McDonald's tastes the same no matter where you go. It's all the same. We didn't go there, but that's truth, amen. Except the Philippines, it don't taste the same there. We've got all these things. We're having basically, we're having a business meeting this week. And we're going to decide the fates of men and women, boys and girls, by the decisions we make. So we can come in dragging around and having a bad time and looking forward to it being over. Or we can come in exciting like they did there. The excitement was there. Notice the second thing, the involvement was there. Look at verse number 3. And they come unto him bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now, they got involved with what was going on, didn't they? Thank God for that. Have you ever carried a grown man? Now, there's some grown men in this building that I wouldn't try to carry. I'm just looking around. I'm just saying that some of them I, I might try, but some of them, might, you know, I'm just. God bless you. I see that hand over there. Hard to carry a grown man. Hard. Played football out in West Texas, Andrews High School, and, and we had sadistic coaches. They hated us. Thought they did. They'd sit around all day while we was in class thinking up ways to kill us. More we'd play, you know, we'd scrimmage and work out and all that in full pads in West Texas. You know how hot it is and everything. And then in the end, they'd make us run wind sprints up and down because they're trying to kill us. But we was young. They couldn't kill him yet. One of them, while he was spitting tobacco juice, well, they said don't smoke, but they did that. Looked up at the bleachers, and he nudged, nudged over and said, if we made them run them down the bleachers, we could kill a lot more. So they blew the whistle and got us over there, and we were running up, and, but none of us dropped dead. They were so disappointed over there. I mean, you could just tell their hearts were broken because none of us were dying. One of them said, you know what? If we made them carry each other up and down the bleachers, no doubt we could kill some of them. So they paired us off according to size. I was a freshman. I was about big around as one of those microphone stands back there. You don't have to make any comments about... Thank you. But I was tall, and they paired me up as a freshman with a senior can't think of his name now, but I, I had to carry him up and down those bleachers. And he talked in my ear all the way up and down. He said, Noble, if you drop me, I'm going to kill you. And I believed him. It, it is hard, hard, hard to carry a grown man. It's easier if you got two. Share the load. It's a little easier if you got three, but that's an odd number. But if you got four, isn't that about right? Amen. I mean, I mean, there's four things you can get a hold of. And, and unless somebody comes along and wants to get a hold of an ear, that you, there's just not much there to get a hold. But four is about right. Now, four of them, they got involved in taking their friend to see Jesus. Maybe their thought was this. Jesus may never go see our friend, but if we could get our friend to Jesus, we have faith, without faith it's impossible to believe, that the Lord could do something for our friend. So they got involved. I remember uh, years ago when we were living in a bus and uh, uh, we got to a church up in Batavia, Ohio. We still go there every year. And uh, it, they were having, having uh, services in an old barn. It was over 100 years old, big old hand-hewn beams, and they had fixed it up, and it's very nice, very nice. And uh, the, the preacher said, would you come out for a Bible? And I said, we'll be there. And we got there in a big old bus, you know, 40-foot bus and a big trailer on the back and all that stuff. They had to get PVC pipe and push the electric lines up where I could get us kind of back in the country. 
I said, preacher, where you may park this bus? His name is Bill Allen. He's not there anymore, but there's another guy there. He's a good guy. And uh, he said, back it right in there on that grass, that, that flat grassy spot back there. I said, now, preacher, I'll back it in there if you want me to, but I want to tell you it's heavy. Jeannie's got all of her shoes with us this week. I mean, she just, never mind. And I said, if I back it in there, if it gets stuck, will you pull me out? See, you learn a few things over the year. You get the preacher to commit up front. You don't wait until you get stuck and say, would you hire a record? No, you get him. Would you pull me out? Oh, yeah, if you get stuck, we'll pull you out. So I had, I had a little, you know, in my hip pocket. And a guy standing there named, his Carl, named Carl Evans, and he's dead now with Jesus. He said, I got an old truck. He said, it's never been stuck in old four-wheel drive. We'll get you out, preacher. So I started backing that bus in, and the further I backed, you know, you could tell. The clutch started slipping, and it started, you know, feeling heavier, and, and finally it got back, and it just quit. Just, just bogged down and quit. Wouldn't go out, wouldn't go in. It's stuck. And I got out, and they said, uh, you're stuck. I said, I know that. I tried to tell you that. Now, the bad thing is, when it quit, it quit over like this. You say, what's so bad about that? Jack up one side of your house and live there for a week. See how you like that, amen? I mean, the poor coffee, you had to do it like this because you was all leaning over like this. Crack eggs and put them in a the skillet, they all ran to one side. Isn't it? The worst part of it was the head of my bed was downhill, and I had the awfulest sinus headache all week. Snot run down to my, can I, can I say snot here? Okay, snot ran down to my head all week. It's awful. We had a great revival. Been back 20 some odd years in a row. Come Saturday morning, closed out Friday night, come Saturday morning. What time you got to leave, Brother Harold? I said, I got to leave, got to be out here by 9 o'clock. I got hour, miles to go to get to the next meeting. Brother Evans said, I'll be there in the morning, we'll pull you out. And so I got up and got the bus all ready to go get my big log chain out and get it hooked up. And he come in there with a four wheel drive Toyota pickup. Now, you know, if you don't have something good to say about a man's truck, just keep your mouth shut. So I uh, wrapped that chain around, the, you know, the ball on the back. He said, now, he said uh, well, when I give you the signal, we'll pull on it. I said, okay. And I went back and got in the truck and in the bus. And Jeannie looked out the window. kind of had to look down to see out the window from where the floor was. She said, that's not going to pull us out. I said, I know, baby, but there ain't nothing I can do about it right now. He looked out the window, you know, and he gave me the thumbs up. And I went, He let the clutch out and all four wheels went to digging for worms. He never even took the belly out of the chain. I mean, ne never even got the chain straight. He got out and I got out and he said, it's stuck. I said, no, I'm trying to tell you that. It's stuck. Fella came out, brought brother Randy come out there. He had a little four, a little one ton Ford dump truck, had a big load of junk on the back. He was taking somewhere to sail. And he, we hooked a chain on the front of that Toyota to, the, to that Ford truck and pulled on a while. Now, the bus didn't come out, but we made that Toyota a lot longer. <laughs> and we hooked the church bus on the front of the on the front of the dump truck, on the front of the Toyota in front of my bus. And then we hooked a guy's station wagon on the front of the church bus, on the front of the dump truck, on the front of the Toyota. We finally got enough pulling that pulled it out of that hole. It looked like a freight train run out across the yard. What I'm saying is this, the more that get a hold of the load, the lighter it becomes. Involvement. Everybody at Trinity Baptist needs to get involved in missions. Mamas and daddies, teach your children how to tithe. Teach them how to give to missions. Amen. Let them earn some money. Don't give them, let them earn the money. And then teach them, give part of it to missions. I'm not saying that just because I'm a missionary. I'm saying that because it's good to teach your children the right way. We see the excitement was there. That took a long time. The involvement was there. The expectation was there in verse number four. The Bible said, And when they could not come nigh to him for the press, then covered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed where in the sick of the palsy lay. When they got there and they couldn't get in because of the crowd, they went to plan B. Now I'm glad God don't never have a plan. Don't never. Y'all understood that, didn't you? He doesn't have a plan B. Only, the only thing he has is plan A, and plan A always works. Amen. 
But these guys, thank God, had a plan B. If they couldn't get in this way, they went around and got in this way. Amen. I have no mission. In fact, I know missionaries. They can't get in to preach the gospel, but they go in as educators, and then they preach the gospel. Find a way to get the lost to Jesus. Find a way. Find a way to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. They had some expectation of what God's going to do. I expect God to do something. And I want to tell you something. When these missionaries, Brother Ryan and his wife and, and, and Brother uh, uh, Christian and his wife, when we go to a mission field, we go, go expecting God to do something. On our table, above the table, we've kind of got a little motto, a new motto for our ministry. And we call it, Give God a reason to bless you. Do something scripturally that gives God a reason to say, you know, I believe I'm just going to bless him. He was obedient. He started tithing. He's given a mission. He's being faithful. He's reading his Bible. That gives me a reason to do something good in his life. We just kind of knock around just waiting for God to do something. No, do something that gives him a reason. The expectation ought to be there. The excitement was there. The involvement was there. The expectation was there. The excuses was there. Look in verse 6 and 7. The Bible said, And there were certain scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now, in every crowd, there's going to be those that are doubters. They don't have that mission conference, but I doubt they do any good. Hello? Well, we can send them down there. and We can send the Joneses over there. And, I doubt that they're going to do We got those. Well, I doubt the Lord can do anything, you know, in these countries. And they, be, they may not question the questions these guys had, but there's a lot of folk in churches today and probably some here tonight that just don't think it's going to help at all to send somebody to a foreign country. But 12 or 13 precious souls got saved last year. Six or seven got saved this week from the ministries of Trinity Baptist Temple. Thank God for that. Are you listening to me? There's going to be those that make excuses. We cannot dwell on what they're not doing. We've got to get busy on what God told us to. Here's what I found out about people that make excuses. They won't get up and go with you. They just criticize you for what you're doing. Huh? Just criticize you for what you're doing. I had a fellow verbally attack me at the back of a church somewhere. I can't remember where. Lord, let me forget it. Isn't that wonderful? My wife said I have a Teflon brain. Nothing sticks. What did you say amen for? Yeah. And this guy said, what makes you think you ought to go over and help all those kids over there in the Philippines and, and uh, Vietnam and, uh, and uh, India and Romania and Honduras when we got kids right here in America that needs help? Usually I'm not too bright, but the Lord helped me that night. I said, sir, I'm so glad you're concerned about the kids here in America. Why don't you join me, Brian Noble Children's Foundation? You can be our, our representative here and work here, and we'll go overseas. He didn't want to do that. Now, he wouldn't get up and go with me. He wouldn't get up at all. He just wanted to criticize what I was doing. Don't be that person. Amen. The, the excitement was there. The involvement was there. The expectation was there. The excuses was there. The execution was there. What are you talking about there? Look down at verse number 11. Jesus said, go back to verse 10, but the, 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 you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said, the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way unto thine house. Jesus did something beyond what any of them thought that was ever going to happen there that he did something that they couldn't do. They couldn't raise this guy off this bed. They couldn't forgive sins. They, I can't do that. Called our son yesterday as his birthday, 33 years old. I said, 33. I said, that's the same age Jesus was when he died. He said, I know, Dad, and I've been thinking about it. I hadn't raised the dead. I hadn't walked on. I hadn't done anything. I want to tell you something. The Lord's wanting to do a work somewhere. The Lord's wanting to do some work somewhere. And he's wanting us to get involved in it. And he wants everybody involved in it. 
Oh, the execution. I want to tell you something. We have a message from God to the world. What is it? Repentance and remission of sin. That's what you're to preach when you go to Congo. Not, you know, thank God for getting clean water and we try to do that country we go to. That's good. Jesus fed the crowd. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But repentance and remission of sin. That's the message. Not only do we have a message, we have a ministry. And that's to evangelize and baptize and teach them to evangelize and baptize and teach them to evangelize. It's a, it just keeps going. Amen. God's got a pyramid scheme. Hello? Yeah. But it works like this. He started with him, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it grows. I want to be a part of that. We have a message. We have a ministry. We have a mission. What is our mission? Go ye into all the world. Teacher, I can't do that. I can't leave my job. My kids are in school. I can't, how can I go into all the world? Listen to me. Listen to me. Give the mission program of this church. And then when you go out there and see that board, you can say, I've been to Congo. And I've been to Guatemala. Where do you go? He goes everywhere. I've been to Mexico. I've been to, I've been to India. I've been to these places. Why? Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And God knew that you couldn't go to every country in the world, but he still said to do it. Amen? We do it by giving and supporting those that are going. We have a message and a ministry and a mission. We have a mandate. Why do you go? Jesus said this. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. I have a, I'm being sent from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the world can't say anything about that. Can't say anything about that. The lady asked me one time, what, what are you doing here passing out this literature, these tracts and stuff? I said, because Jesus told me to. She couldn't say anything about that. I didn't say the Baptist sent me. I didn't say the government sent me. I said, Jesus sent me. What are you going to do about that? I didn't say that. The excitement was there. The involvement was there. The expectation was there. The excuses were there. The execution was there. The evidence was there. Look in verse 12. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. And so much that they were all amazed and glorified God, say, we never saw it on this fashion. i tell you this, folks. Listen to me. God can do something. Now, that's all the introduction. Let me give you Four or five message, four or five minutes of the message. Not a sermon, but a message. Look in verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith. Now, I want you to imagine. Four guys bring their friend to, to see Jesus. This is a house, and Jesus is in here preaching. They can't get in the door, so they go up on the roof. It's probably a thatch roof. Maybe clay tile. Could have been. Maybe dusty. Dirty, wasn't any, of course, insulation. Jesus is in this house preaching, and the dust starts falling down around him. And the labor of these men start happening, and Jesus looks up, and what did verse 5 say? When he saw their faith, all he can see is the bottom of the bed. He can't even see who's on top of it. Now, he's God. He knows who he is. He's omniscient. But he doesn't say he sees the guy's faith. He saw their faith. Right now, this fellow don't have the faith to get saved. How do you know? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. When he hears the Word of God from Jesus' mouth in a minute, he's going to get healed. Amen? But the Lord don't see his faith to get saved. He sees their faith to bring their friend to Jesus. You say, what's Faith Missions Conference about? It's about your faith, and your faith, and your faith, and my faith in what God can do in the Congo. They don't know yet. They're on the stretcher. He's looking at us to see if we've got the faith to take our friend to Jesus. We can't bring them in here, but we can send those two over there. A knucklehead and a knuckle dragger. Was that what, did I have that right? I thought I, thought, I thought I had that pretty close. He's looking at our faith to say, here's some money. Go in some soul. Say, how do I do that? 
You don't figure it up and see if you can. Then it's done by sight. It's done by figuring. You pray and ask God, what can I trust you for? What can I trust you for? I don't have it. But if you'll tell me what I can trust you for, I'll give it by faith. The first mention in the Bible is a principle that holds true almost all the time. When something's first mentioned, it just about holds true every time. Hannah doesn't have a child. She comes to the priest and said, and prays this to God, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him to you. Whatever you can trust me with, I'll give it to you. That's faith promise. That's giving something you don't have and really can't know that you're going to get. But if you'll give it to me, I'll give it to God. In this way, we become just a piece of pipe, conduit. God puts it on this end. Don't hold out on God. Don't take any out for handling, what, the, what they call it, shipping and handling. You know, Lord, if you give me $100 a week, I'll put it in a mission program. So he gives you $100, say, no, I'll just take nine out here, you know, and I'll give 91. Is that right? Well, you know, faith gets into action. When faith sits around and does nothing, you can't see it. But when faith starts moving, you can see what it's doing. Jesus didn't see his faith. He saw their faith. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed for just a few moments. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, how we need a touch from you. Lord, how we long to see you do a work in our hearts and lives that no one gets the glory for. No one gets the praise for but you. Lord, a work in our hearts and lives that we say it, it isn't us and it can't be us. And I couldn't do it. It's just the Lord. Just the Lord. Father, I pray that you'd help our hearts tonight to trust you. You are trustworthy. You, Father, are trustworthy. I can trust you. I can trust you for what we'll do about faith and about missions this week. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Will you stand with us while... Our brother begins to sing. If you need to find a place at an altar, you come tonight and ask God to help you. While these are praying, would you come? Would you mind the Lord? Maybe the Lord spoke to your heart tonight about taking a step to full-time service. Come and talk to the pastor about that.
John chapter 5, there's a place called the Pool of Bethesda. We know this story. Man laid there 38 years. Jesus comes by and said, Sir, wilt thou be made whole? Now notice the, what the man says. He said, I have no man to put me in the pool. Will you be the one that gives some money that allows somebody to get in? God bless you, Pastor. Amen. What a blessing. That was an amazing blessing. Brother Harold, thank you for that. And I pray that um, we would all take that, that challenge and say, God, what do you want me to do? Faith in action. And uh, again, I pray that you're challenged. I pray that this week you will pray, God, what is it that you want from me? What do you want from me in my service? What do you want from me in my giving? Uh, Wednesday night, we'll do Faith Promise. We'll have cards. And uh, many of you have done that before, but it's a way that we... Uh, support our missionaries and it's a way that we can uh, count on what we can do and and uh, hope that you'll be praying about th that this week and, and uh, if you haven't been a part of faith promise as brother harold was sharing you, you're missing blessings i'm just i'm just saying there's person after person that can share uh, the the blessing it is to be able to give and support and uh, so i encourage you to be praying about that if you have been praying this year we're doing a couple things and and we're we'll dismiss um Number one is you see around the, the corner of the sanctuaries, the different regions again. Uh, we talked, and, and uh, we want to continue that. There's cards on a chair beside each region, and uh, the Europe and Africa, the Asias, Americas, and what was the other, the Philippines. And um, we want to encourage you to take this opportunity to grab a card and say for this year, maybe last year you committed to the Americas, Maybe you committed to Asia last year to pray for those missionaries every day, to email them, maybe send them birthday cards, Christmas presents, whatever. Uh, maybe this year you'll, you'll take to Asia uh, or Europe and Africa and, and do that. And so I want to encourage you to, to continue that. Our missionaries need to hear from us. They need to, the, God, their, their names need to be brought before the throne of God. And so uh, we want to encourage you to do that. Again, the faith promise, be praying about that. We'll do that Wednesday. Uh, also, we are going to be announcing a, uh, a mission trip uh, that we're going to make available, and uh, it's going to be a limited number of people that we can take, but we'll talk about where that mission trip is going to be on Wednesday night and uh, how you can go about doing that. Uh, I will say that it's going to be an amazing opportunity uh, at, a, at, a, at an affordable price for a mission trip. And so um, we'll, again, talk about that Wednesday night, give you details about that, be praying uh, for that as well, and uh, also... In the back, there's T-shirts uh, for uh, this mission conference, uh, the mission theme that we have this year, a life with mission. There's $17, and just to, just to let you know, that covers the cost of the shirts and about $5 uh, extra that's going to go towards uh, uh, missions and our missionaries. So uh, you can get a shirt. If your size isn't back there, there's order forms. You can fill it out. We're going to place an order after this. And so don't, don't leave... Uh, without getting that. Uh, it's, it's a great blessing. We wear those throughout the year and from here on out. And people can ask us, what is mission with life or life with mission? And give us an opportunity to share Jesus with them. So, um, anything else that I needed to talk about? Countries, the schedule, don't forget about uh, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. And uh, I want to ask our missionaries to go by. There are tables there. And I encourage you, again, to go by there and, and just bless them, talk with them, encourage them. And, uh, get to know them. If you haven't got to know them real well, go by and get to know them. All right. Well, let's pray and dismiss. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this evening once again. Lord, I thank you for the message, God, that you have uh, brought to us tonight. We thank you for your word. God, I pray that each one of us are challenged. I know I am. Every time I hear that story, teach it, preach it, Lord, whatever uh, it happens, any time I hear that story, it just it stirs my heart, Lord, that we all have a responsibility to bring others to you. Uh, God, help us never come up with an excuse why we can't, just as those men did, not they did everything they could to bring their friend to you. And I pray that we would do the same. God, that there would be faith and action in our lives. 
This week, I pray that you would continue to stir our hearts and, and prepare us. Lord, if there's someone here that has been feeling your tug to ministry, your tug to missions, God, that they wouldn't delay. If it's you, if they know it's you calling them, I pray this week they would surrender their lives. Just give you full control. Lord, I pray that we would all do that in our lives, just surrender to you completely. Here I am, Lord, send me, Lord. I just pray that would be our prayer, and uh, God, that you would just do great things. We thank you for our missionaries, and I pray that you would bless them. And uh, Just take us home safely tonight, Lord, and help us to come back tomorrow night excited and ready for another night to worship you, to, to be stirred, and uh, to hear your word. And uh, Lord, we again thank you for this opportunity. And we ask and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.